to Bishop and Mrs. McKee and to all of you who are the members and leaders of the North Texas Annual Conference, grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ. I count it a great honor to be with you via this digital medium, and I am grateful that your bishop and my friend Bishop McKee preached for the West Ohio Annual Conference, which we just adjourned a few days ago, using the same medium and technology. Thank you, Bishop McKee, for doing that and for the many ways that we have partnered in ministry, and most of all, for your friendship. Hear now the reading of this text from the letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. It reads on this wise, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power, through God's Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto the one who by the power and work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. To all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Grant, O oh, eternal one, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may find in acceptance in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in North Texas, your theme for this annual conference session, Rooted in Love, has already been a blessing to me. It is mostly because I can't stop humming and singing. And I confess to you that I go back and forth and all around humming or singing or reciting the words of songs that may be referred to as so-called sacred and other songs that come from the larger culture that is outside the church and yet in many ways is fully a part of the church. Just a moment ago when I prayed, I used a hymn. I used the poetic words of that Scottish preacher, George Matheson, in his hymn entitled, O Love, that will not let me go. This pastor preacher who began losing his sight at age 15 and was totally blind, I'm told, by age 18, speaks of the writing of this hymn and says that it came to him out of great anguish and suffering. There can only be and has only been speculation about the details of that anguish or of that suffering. But one of the stories I heard early on as a young preacher and pastor had to do with him having a deep love relationship with a young woman that he believed would be his wife, as the story goes. But ultimately, she severed the bond. She walked away. She ended the relationship because it was difficult for her to imagine being with someone for the rest of her life who was not physically sighted. When she broke or walked away from that relationship, so to speak, his response, according to this tale, was to look to God and to cry out and to seek assurance from God and in God that God's love never leaves us never forsakes us. God's love never walks away. God's love never cuts the tie. God's love never 
severs the cord. We may never know for sure the precise genesis of Matheson's words, but we cannot miss the meaning of them. His was a cry of both anguish and assurance, mixed together with a declaration or an affirmation of faith. And he declared in this hymn, God's love will never let us go with magnificent and soaring poetry. How could it, my friends, that is, how could God's love ever let us go when indeed creation itself is, from a theological perspective, an act of love? Our very human existence bespeaks the love of God, if you read the narrative in Genesis, and if you listen to the poetic interpretation of James Weldon Johnson, who in his volume entitled God's Trombones, has seven sermons coming out of the African-American church and preaching tradition that he has put in magnificent verse and in his piece called The Creation. There is this scene after God has spoken the world into being. God has declared there to be light. God has uh, created all parts of the creation. And then James Weldon Johnson depicts God anthropologically sitting down on a side of a hill, the poetry says, where God could think. And then the poet goes on to say that God held God's head in God's hand. And out of his own loneliness, it says, he thought and he thought and he thought. And then he said, I'll make humankind. Can you imagine? How could God ever cut the cord with us when we exist out of God's love and God's imaginativeness and God's yearning for community? To be in relationship not only with the fullness of God's self, which we can never completely conceive, but to be in communion and community with other aspects of God's creation of which we are a part. What's more, not only are we created all along with the rest of creation out of God's heart and out of God's love and out of God's largesse, <laughs> But we are sustained by God's love, even in our brokenness, with all, as one preacher said, of our derelictions and delinquencies, where we stray from the heart of God's love. Everything that we know about God, especially if we read the biblical record, and when we think about our own relationship with God, individually and collectively, suggests to us that God's love is pure, it's unadulterated, it is relentless. God is in relentless pursuit of us because God desires relationship. And even when we have gone astray, God seeks to be in relationship with us. And God bids us turn to God again. God bids us, if you take some of the biblical images, come home. Find your heart in God again. We are God's creation. God created us out of love. And God's love for us will never be revoked. I referred earlier to my inability to think about the theme of love and not find myself singing or humming or reciting the words of some song, either out of the Christian faith tradition or out of a larger cultural experience. And sometimes the songs of the larger culture speak to us of love or dare I say, of the failure to love or of unrequited love or of love that seems elusive. Just as effectively as some of the hymns of the faith, though they may not reference God. But also these songs about love from the larger culture speak to us of the risk of love and the vulnerability of love. And maybe that is what we fear 
we will experience being at risk if we love, being vulnerable if we love, being exposed if we love. If we open our hearts to other, the others, there is the risk that they will be broken, we will be hurt. If we are generous with others, there is the risk that we may not receive generosity in return. Is that what Tina Turner was saying? As I have seized upon her famous song, which I have used as the title of this homily, what's love got to do with it? Can you hear her? She says, you must understand how the touch of your hand makes my pulse react. That it's only the thrill of a boy meeting girl. Opposites attract. It's physical, only logical. You must try to ignore that it means more than that. Oh, oh, what's love got to do with it? What's love, she queries, but a secondhand emotion. What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart? when a heart can be broken. If you and I were to exegete in community this song, she's saying a lot, both at the surface and beneath the surface, about the nature of love, about the risk of love, about vulnerability, about our natural physical needs and inclinations in or out of love. But she raises the question about encounters between people who would be lovers. What's love got to do with it? As the Christian community, we have a response and an answer to that called covenant and relationship and sometimes marriage. But Tina Turner, out of her own experience, I mean, I understand this is popular music and that there is a financial motive as well, but often we sing our joys as well as our pains. And her question continues, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Or may I turn to the songs of Roberta Flack and Donnie Hathaway? Again, in the form of a question, they say six times, five times, where is the love? Where is the love? And then in the verses, you said you give to me as soon as you were free. Will it ever be? Where is the love? You told me that you didn't love him and you were going to say goodbye. But if you really didn't mean it, why did you have to lie? And Hathaway and Flack come back again. And they keep asking over and over and over and over and over again of this song, where is the love? These two songs speak of frustrations, shall we say, of personal and romantic love. They speak of the desire for relationship, but feeling that either trust has been broken or I should never give my heart in trust again. These feelings are not left only to us in personal, one-on-one -on -one kind of romantic relationships. They come up in our friendships. They come up in our working relationships. Even in the church, have we not heard people cry out in a moment of frustration when there has been enmity and strife? Where is the love? And oh, not to be too lost in the world of romance as we keep singing our way through this theme rooted in love. Marvin Gaye raised this to a new level, a social level, a systemic level when he pointed out the poverty of love in our society, particularly in the 60s and 70s, and the call by Gaye, Marvin Gaye, that its renewal, our renewal as a society that was fair and just and whole, that the only path to a redeemed and healed social future was in asking the question, what's going on? And in responding with love. Can you hear him? Mother, mother, there's too many of us crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today.
He goes on, Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. You see, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. In and out of the church, the song traditions of the human family deal with matters of love one-on-one -on -one and at a social and systemic level that we must take seriously. They speak to that which we yearn for the most and that which we need the most. Indeed, we begin our lives rooted in love because we are created out of God's love. But our rootedness, your theme, y'all, gets tested all the time. Even for those of us of Christian faith, that which is rooted must always struggle to stay rooted because if you take the botanical viewpoint or the agrarian viewpoint, that which is rooted in the plant world is always subject to the vicissitudes of wind and water and drought and scorch. And in our personal lives, we refer to this inability to keep faith with love, dare I say, to be uprooted <laughs> as our own human sinfulness. And it is true also at a social and systemic level. Whether we are struggling with the temptation to be other than loving in our personal or our societal relationships, when we are wrestling with systemic evil, may I say to you, the call to us as the followers of Jesus Christ is to always let all of our thoughts, all of our actions, all of our responses be shaped by the love of God that we have seen in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I did not say that it was easy. And I'm abundantly aware that sometimes victims and abused parties are the ones that feel like the burden of mercy, grace, forgiveness, and love is on them. But for us in Christ, at the foot of the cross, the call to live our way into love, even as we dismantle the isms and the evils of our age, it must be rooted and grounded in love. Let me say it even more strongly. You and I are never released, even when we've gone astray and felt ourselves uprooted from the call and the command to love. We may excuse ourselves by saying, well, we're only human. But I stopped by to tell you we never get a pass on love. It is not as though God's commandment to love God, neighbor, and self is not a directive. It is not a suggestion that says to us, listen, Greg, love only if and when convenient. Oh, but I'm fighting evil. Well, I may be in a fight, but Paul said to the Corinthians in the second correspondence, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. No, the call of God to love is for all times and for all situations, no matter how difficult. We will fail. We have failed. The call to love does not go away. Our personal relationships should never be cheapened or commodified, and we should not walk away from them acting as if love is not the calling claim upon our lives, no matter the hurt we feel. Because of love, we must always be answering the question of who are our neighbors and responding out of the heart of Jesus and seeing all of those around us through the eyes of Jesus. We must fight against being sucked into love and law arguments as if we can compartmentalize our lives that neatly and cleanly. No, we must fight to love and we must fight for love because hate, enmity, strife, alienation, and indifference. See, sometimes we, we, we act like we're not hating 
on each other. We're just being cool and indifferent. No, even indifference is too costly to the human spirit and to the reign of God and to the witness of the church. And as Dr. King and others have said, only love can drive out hate. As Marvin Gaye says, only love conquers hate. Perhaps this struggle is why forgiveness and reconciliation are so hard. The hurt has sometimes personally or systemically and socially been so deep and it has gone on for so long that we, we don't know where to dig in to begin, where to pick up. It just seems easier to keep on hating or being indifferent or living apart or living unreconciled with the people around us. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, whose death last year I still mourn, <laughs> had been chief rabbi of his part of the Jewish world in England for over 20 years. In a volume that I go back and read portions of every year, entitled The Dignity of Difference, How to Avoid the Clash of Civilizations, tells a story near the end of the book about Laura Blumenfeld, who has her own book about revenge and its limitations. Laura is a young Jewish woman at the time of this incident that Sachs recounts whose father was shot in the old city in Jerusalem in 1986 by a Palestinian terrorist. She went on to become a, a, a journalist. Her father was not killed, though his life obviously was changed and the life of his family was changed. As a part of her own search for healing and hope and a new future, which was laced with tones of revenge, in her journalistic career, she ended up in the Middle East and she befriended the family of the gunman who had shot her father in the old city. And she even began a correspondence with the terrorist who himself was imprisoned. She visited with the family and they did not know who she was. She had not disclosed that. She treated it as if she was just writing a story and she recited any number of incidences in which they or other members of the Palestinian community might have been involved. And the shooter's father tried to explain that it was the duty out of rectifying a painful history that his son or son's actions were what they were. She goes on to testify at the trial, having heard even the shooter's brothers say, this was just my brother's duty. It was nothing personal. And while she was on the stand testifying at Omar's trial, he has a name eventually. Her goal was to help this family and the whole world see that it may not be personal to them, but it was personal to her. That was her father. That was her dad. That was her past. And she was his future. As she's testifying at the trial, her mother stands in the back of the courtroom. At first, Laura does not know it's her. Just a voice that blurts out, I forgive Omar for what he did. And then she continues, and it is time for the state of Israel to forgive him. Laura is flustered, flabbergasted, when she realizes that not only this unwelcome word to live into forgiveness is being spoken at all, but that it's coming from her own mother. But they get through it and Laura and her mother walk out of the courtroom embracing and holding each other in tears and then Omar's family follows them and there are words of healing, hope, and reconciliation. There is some embrace of biblical proportions if you read some of the stories of reconciliation, especially in the book of Genesis. And then this note comes from Omar, the gunman, to Laura who says, we have been in a state of war 
And now we are passing through a new stage of historical reconciliation where there is no place for hatred and detestation. Rabbi Sachs goes on to comment after he narrates this journey of the Blumenfeld family. And I quote now, love is more than a possession. It is a part of the ability to let go and without it we kill what we most love. Every act of forgiveness, he continues, mends something broken in this fractured world. The call to love is always a call to heal. It is not a therapy thing. It is not only about roses and flowers and hugs and kisses and embraces among family members or friends and neighbors. Love is about acting out and living in to the healing of broken relationships. And so I ask of you hearing this narrative and thinking about your own theme, how might any of this speak to a fractured United Methodist Church? How might acts of healing and reconciliation Help us as United Methodists, you in the North Texas Conference, me in the West Ohio Conference, us in the general and jurisdictional and central conferences. How might this recollection that we are called to love at all times, which sometimes means the hard work of healing and redemption and forgiveness, how might we truly conference or confer together through the lenses of love and healing and, dare I say, hope. As I prepare to close, I'm struck by a verse of Scripture that I am not aware that I had paid attention to until I was about 19 years old. I was at a Sunday evening service at Cynthia, my wife's home church in South Philadelphia, and they were having a series of Sunday evening Lenten services. You know the drill. A preacher came from a neighboring church. He pulled a little black New Testament out of his pocket. I don't even know how he read it. The print was so small that I couldn't have read it when I was 19 years old. He opened that New Testament and he turned to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. And he read one verse. And here is a portion of the verse. Remember now, the background is Passover is coming. Jesus is getting ready for the festival along with others. And hear this portion of John 13, 1. It references Jesus. It's the, the narrator's commentary, the gospel writer's telling of it. And he says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Let me say it one more time, North Texas. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I told you that love, healing, forgiveness, redemption, and hope were sometimes hard work. They were not the thing of chocolates and roses only. They were not the thing of going along to get along. They were the thing of truth-telling and of accountability, but truth-telling and accountability that was not intended to cancel you, but intended to call you in to a new, healed, and redeemed, and truthful relationship. I need to tell you, I hate, I hate, God help me, I hate the idea of the cancel culture. Because I'm absolutely persuaded that the mindset, the philosophy, the theology, if there is one, of a cancel culture is that there is no redemption. A cancel culture ends up in, uh, in war that is unrestricted where we go into the Colosseum and somebody ultimately dies, but he who stands or she who conquers today will have their own head cut off in the future. A cancel culture cuts off redemption and allows us to be sucked into a culture 
where we impose the death penalty and impose it with a great unevenness. I could go on and on and on, and I'm back to John 13 and 1, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And that's the kind of love you and I have been called. Who do you love all the way to the end? And for whom would you go to the lengths that Jesus of Nazareth went because of his love for us and he was acting out the heart of the love of God who I said to you earlier whose love was so unrelenting that it chases us down and keeps giving us altar call after altar call, invitation after invitation. And so I close with a song. I began with a song. I can't stop from singing about this love thing. I'm a Wesleyan after all. And can't you hear Charles Wesley saying, love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth, come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling. This is an ongoing project of love. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. A dwelling is something that you build from the ground up. It's got to be rooted. It's got to be anchored. It's got to be fixed. And Wesley goes on, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, but not just, not just me. Enter every trembling heart. I told you, if you start exegeting these hymns and these songs, you'll get religion right tonight. But then we come to that closing verse. I love it. Where Wesley says, finish then thy new creation. Pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Saints, I came by to tell you when love is hard and tough and when you don't feel like it. Maybe you just ought to send up a shaft of prayer and say, Master, finish thy new creation. Finish thy new creation. I'm not all that I ought to be. I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not yet all that I ought to be. God is not through with me, with you, with the church yet. Finish thy new creation. Pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee. Watch this now. Lost in wonder. Lost in love. And lost in praise. It was love in the beginning. <laughs> it's love all the way through, despite our derelictions and delinquencies, and it will be love <laughs> that will bring us safely in. In the name of God who creates, who redeems, and who sanctifies the church and the world. Amen.